Welcome to Tuesdays with BOA. This is a collaboration between Writers and Books and BOA Editions. My name is Dan Hurd. I'm the Director of Adult Programs at Writers and Books. Writers and Books is a nonprofit literary arts center in Rochester, New York. We offer readings, workshops, and literary programming for people of all ages, all currently available online. Our theme for 2021 is taking care. We're celebrating different ways we can take care of ourselves and take care of others this year. You can check out our upcoming schedule at wab.org. Please say hello in the chat and let us know you're out there. You can also submit questions through the Q&A function. The Naomi Letters is out today and available through our bookstore, Ampersand Books. I'll put the link in the chat. We're so excited to have Rachel Menes with us this evening. First, we'll hear from Rachel, then she'll be in conversation with Bo Editions Director of Development and Communications, Genevieve Hartman. The so writer Robert Becker has said, original, piercing, the Naomi Letters makes a startling, unforgettable contribution to contemporary American poetry. Rachel Menes is the author of The Naomi Letters and The Glad Hand of God Points Backwards, winner of the Walt McDonald First Book Prize in Poetry and finalist for a National Jewish Book Award. Her poems and essays have been published in The Believer, American Poetry Review, Kenyon Review, and elsewhere. She serves as the book reviews editor for Agni and the series editor of the Walt McDonald First Book Prize. Menis currently lives in Chicago, where she works as a writer, editor, and adjunct professor. Rachel, thank you so much for being here. Hi, uh, thank you so much, Dan, for that uh, wonderful intro. and. Uh, thank you all. I'm starting to sort of start to see the names that are uh, surfacing in this in this reading. My my first of a, the the tour for the Naomi Letters, and it's so amazing to see all of you here tonight. Even though I know we're we're together and at a distance, it's a it's the the new normal. Um, before I get to in into the poetry, I want to first take a moment to thank um, Genevieve Hartman, my, my uh, co-host and Q&A facilitator for the night, um, and everyone at BOA Editions. I was thinking today as I was getting ready for this reading about how, um, and some of the folks that are actually here tonight knew me at this point in my life, like when I was in middle school and high school and I was going to the library and I was Xeroxing, uh, favorite poems to like clip into my scrapbooks and save to read for later and write all over um, and bring to my friends at the literary magazine. Like the, some of the books that I cherished the most, even back then um, were Boa Editions books. I, um, we read the young Lee at our wedding. Um, I, I can't even begin to start listing, uh, you know, that it just means so much to me to join a um, continuum of poets whose work has shape my own in such profound and lasting ways and continues to. Um, the folks who have had books come out this spring with BOA have also just been, um, it's been such a fantastic group to kind of like bring these books out into the world with. So thank you so much. Um, I don't know if I can ever express my gratitude enough to the, the work that you've done to steward this book into the world, um, especially um, this year. <laughs> I'll, um, I'll talk a little bit about, uh, I, I, one of the things I like about tonight's format, I will definitely read a lot of poems, um, is that there's some room for discussion and chat, which those of you who know me know is totally my jam. And um, I think that I will open by saying that anybody who did anything on the behalf of another person at such a difficult year as last year deserves uh, all the praise in the world. So the, I know to this book came alive in 2020, but you know, it's the finished product, what you see in the world takes a lot of um, logistics and time. And I'm just so grateful to that, um, to all of you that help make this happen. So um, this is the Naomi letters. I am going to read from the first section of the book. I'll just give a little bit of background. I think this book needs um, just a tiny bit of setup. And then I will read from the book's first section. So the Naomi Letters is a, a poetry collection that is entirely made up of epistolary poems, love letters um, written from the speaker uh, to Naomi. And so you'll hear Naomi's name a lot. She appears in almost all of the poems. And they were um, written and are set from the summer of 2016 through the summer of 2017 with a sort of like epilogue or coda 
at the very end of the book uh, about a year after in uh, late spring of 2018. So the book is in five sections, four main sections, summer, fall, winter, spring, and then spring. And tonight I'm gonna read um, almost exclusively from summer. So we're gonna start at the beginning and um, I'm gonna read a set that sort of set up the book and open, I think the book's sort of like primary um, arguments and stakes and uh, just sort of gives a good first look at what the book is up to. So hopefully that'll be a good, um, I know for a lot of folks just getting the book um, today or this week will be a good introduction to the collection. So I'm gonna open with the first poem in the, um, in the book that's inside the first section. Um, it's called July 10th, 2016. Um, almost all of the poems in this collection have date titles. A few have different titles that we may run into um, shortly, but most of these, the date um, is the title. So this is the first one, July 10th, 2016. Yesterday, Naomi, a man jumped to his death from the bridge beside my house. A runner found his body on the path 50 yards below, lying in a shape I cannot stop imagining. Does it matter that I once threw pebbles over this bridge to see how fast they'd fall? I imagined my body the size of a hundred small stones moving in unison. How I longed for the rock silence once they reached the ground, but I could never lift both of my feet from the earth at once. Today, I press my cheek to the bridge facing window, feel the sun's heat gathering at the border of the pane. Today, I watch the cut red tulips open towards the waning light. I have so much more to tell you about being alive. Um, so for those of you who don't know where I'm currently based, I'm in Chicago. Um, if you heard a low rumble in the middle of that poem, you do not need to adjust your speakers. I live right off the blue line. Um, and, uh, I've been apologizing on zoom since March of 2020 about the train. So thank you all for bearing with me. Um, I'm going to keep moving, uh, with the next, the next poem. Um, we're skipping a few in the book to August and, um, I wanted to briefly mention something in this poem. Um, those of you in the audience tonight who are also poets or writers um, have maybe had moments where you've had to sort of stop what you're doing and write something down. Um, and this was one of those poems for me where I was, um, and it's actually based on like this, this summer when I was working on the book, I was working in a city garden in Homewood um, in Pittsburgh. And um, my friend whose garden, it, she was sort of stewarding had taught me about service berries and what service berries are and what they mean, um, which the poem talks about. And I literally had to go and like wash my hands of soil and go and like type it into my notes app. I was like, this must be in a poem. Um, so here it is uh, in, and made it into this uh, letter that I think I wrote the next day. Um, I don't totally remember, um, but it's called August 23rd, 2016. In an hour, I'll head to the city garden. With Molly and Anne, I'll pull the last summer chard from the ground. We'll collect the final season strawberries, the scallions that grow to the size of an arm. I will reach for the highest service berry named for death how the tree first blooms in the spring once the soil thaws soft enough for a burial. I've learned to harvest one berry at a time to inspect their skin before placing them on the scale with the others. This way they pop on the teeth at their sweetest, their tiny seeds floral and heady like almonds. If you want a pound of them, Naomi, I will bring you a pound. If you want the tree, I will bring you the tree. So this poem comes pretty soon after that one in the collection. And it is the first poem that I'm going to read tonight that um, shows something that happened pretty early on for me when I was writing these poems that carried throughout the whole collection, which is that there are excerpts in here of um, lines from other poets that is, are presented in these poems as um, poems that the speaker really wants to share with Naomi in these letters. And I'm sure um, 
all of us have had this experience one way or another. It's one of my favorite experiences when you're reading something or um, listening to a song or you're at a museum and you see a piece of art and you're like, I can't wait to tell this specific person about this or share it with them. And sometimes that's a romantic impulse. Um, sometimes it's a friend impulse. It's just the sort of like communion around um, wanting to have someone you love have a reaction about a piece of art that you also love. And as I was writing these poems, I realized that I was starting to fold in what I was currently reading at the time as part of this, like, well, if two people are falling in love in, in letters, what would that look like? Well, for me, there would be, there would be poems in there. And in the collection that um, as a good uh, professor and academic citizen, there is a work cited at the back of the book. Um, and in the, in the collection itself, the, um, the lines that are excerpted are italicized and attributed. Um, it's a little trickier to, to sort of like sound italic, <laughs> um, but it, I'll just sort of fold it in, in the reading. Um, but I'll mention ahead of time that this, um, this poem contains a couple snippets from Sharon Old's incredible book, Ode, which I actually think I have right here. Um, I'm not going to be able to pull it out. I'm going to knock over everything around me that you can't see is chaos including this giant stack of books. Um, but I would recommend wholeheartedly um, to read a lot of the stuff that appears in the works cited. There's some of my favorite books. Um, so this is September 5th, 2016. I want to read you a poem. Pink sky in the morning, it opens. A girl's sky. When you look at me, do you see a woman who only knows how to love a man? These were the only stories read to me. This fault too is mine alone. Slowly the trees become visible, old sprites, and the spaces between them. This line makes me think of you, the white space in your letters. All my life I have looked out at the world and never seen between. I clung to each tree I could touch without moving. But here you are, Naomi, and I write to you at dawn. Imagine being able to walk into the woods without fear. The black sky holds all colors close. Anything could happen. I will wait here reading for the sun to rise to show you what it decides. September 10th, 2016. In one version of the story, I find you by way of several minor accidents. A girl in high school used to tell us, look for the guys who drive stick. It means they know what they're doing. Ask them for a ride, she'd say, make them show you. That winter, two boys nearly died speeding down the town's back roads. That winter, I bent over a boy in his borrowed car. His became the first body I studied besides my own. Alone after, I would reach for the electric toothbrush, the wooden spoon, and search for the places he lit for a moment, then darkened. I thought myself the only animal in a frozen city full of men, but I was wrong. I thought I'd starve, but I was wrong. So as we move into September, um, September 2016, <laughs> um, we move closer to November 2016. And um, these poems are dated pretty closely to the dates on which I actually wrote them um, in their earliest drafts. They certainly do not appear as they did when I first wrote them, but the chronology of the sort of anchoring extremely rough snippets that became these final drafts, um, I would say that one of the things that remained the most consistent was actually the, the order, which is something that um, is not typical for my writing process, but I think maybe it makes sense for this project because I was writing them, each letter kind of responded to the previous one. Um, and as I was working on this in the fall of 2016, um, the 2016 presidential election was happening. And um, I picked this poem to read tonight um, for a couple of reasons. And one of which is last week at um, the incredible poet uh, Kendra Colo's reading uh, in this forum with writers and books in celebration of her book, um, I Am Not Trying to Hide My Hungers from the World, which is an incredible, incredible collection. Um, she read a poem that specifically sort of invoked and celebrated the word cunt. And I thought, wait, I have a poem. I have a cunt poem. <laughs> in this book. Um, but it's a very, I mean, it's a very different poem in as much as the, the sort of like meditation on this word 
for me came out of something that I saw on, um, I don't know, like YouTube or a local news video of a rally um, that took place in um, outside of Pittsburgh where I was living at the time and where this book is set, um, who had like a Hillary for prison t-shirt on and was screaming um, what was censored in the video, but the the description was something like a um, gender-based slur for women or something like that, that I was like, we know exactly what this word, uh, what this word is. And I was thinking about what it means for a man at a political rally for a male president um, who's running against the first woman presidential candidate for a major party. Also, this was September, so it was before other information came out about uh, this certain male presidential candidate's predilection for sexual assault. Um, and so I remember thinking at the time, like, how am I hearing this word in this context? And what does it mean? And what does it remind me of? Um, and so this poem came out of that sort of shock and then not shock of, of hearing Kunt screamed at a Trump rally <laughs> on my phone or computer in a quiet room where I was supposed to be writing. Um, so this is September 16th, 2016. In this body, I store all of my books. I have no room for cleverness, Naomi, no room left to be patient. On my computer, an American man at a rally screams the word cunt. I tie back my hair before I write to you. I roll up my sleeves. You've seen this man before too. We've both known him our whole lives. I ran into him once in a nightclub in Washington. Another time, four of him followed me to my car, the street lamp broken above us. Would you like to borrow a book? The text I reach for first describes the side view of a girl. As a child, I'd flatten my stomach with my hands to mitigate my profile. Already, I wished myself invisible. The men still see us everywhere and they insist on seeing us. But the library is yours. Each of its creased pages is yours. The first time I heard my name was in a supermarket parking lot in suburban Philadelphia. My mother said, never repeat that word. It is a terrible word just for a woman. When I asked her the man's name, she said, he has none. When I asked her what to call the man's body, she said, nothing. I cannot fit this name in my mouth and still breathe. Instead, I will write you another letter. It begins and ends like this, Naomi, Naomi, Naomi. All righty, I am gonna read one more poem before we slide into um, chatting with, um, with Genevieve. And because it's the last poem, not just for this moment, but also in the summer section of the book, I wanted to offer just a little bit of context as the first quarter of the poems kind of wrap up. Um, just like at the beginning of any relationship, the first section of the book is sort of full of like early admissions and longing and I miss you and look at this poem and here's who I think I am and here's the shit that I'm sorting through. Um, it hasn't yet quite gotten to the point where everything's on the line, I love you, what they're long distance, like, what am I going to do without you? Um, where, where are you on the other end of the line? So this poem sort of closes out that first section and starts um, using the word love and thinking about love in this context. Um, but as is typical for the speaker, it kind of writes around <laughs> actually saying this and, and sort of offers a couple of different approaches to thinking about love. Um, and this, so this is September 19th, 2016. And then this will be my last, yeah, my last one in the, in the set. In your last letter, you wrote, I have never told somebody I love you. I prefer the more practical, what do you need or else what can I get for you? I too have filled a banquet table with love's industry, Naomi. I've sat across from love silently watching her chew. Are you full yet, love, I ask, and she does not answer. I take the brute sounds of her eating into my heart, and I weigh them. Thanks. Rachel, thank you so much. That was such a wonderful reading. It's always just like such a joy to hear 
and authorating their own work. Um, I did want to mention before we get started with the Q&A that um, if anyone in the audience does have a question, you can go ahead and type that into the Q&A function. Um, I'll keep my eye on that. And so if you have a question for Rachel, please feel free to let us know. So I guess just my first question getting into it is the Naomi Letters is a little bit unique for a collection in that it's all written in letter form. Can you talk a little bit more about what drew you to this form in particular for this project? Yeah, that is an awesome question. I have always found myself really drawn to received forms as a poet, as opposed to maybe more like traditional, um, like metrical forms or verse forms. So like elegies, odes, epistolary poems. Yes, always have been, I feel like there's such a um, incredible history of poets across language and culture and time who uh, work in these forms. And I think because they're driven by inter like by relationship right an elegy is a lament for one gone um the abad is the poem for two lovers departing at dawn the you know epistolary poem got to have two people in play for the most part um if you're writing a letter to another person um so there's something about like the world of all those poems being so big and populated um and then the size of the relationship in the poem being so intimate that is really fascinating to me um i did kind of happen upon this as a project for the Naomi letters, though, in as much as um, when I started working on this, I did not have a sense of it as um, this is a book. This is a book of epistolary poems. Um, I was getting up really early in the morning to try to write ahead of teaching, um, ahead of checking the news, because as I mentioned, that was a the beginning of an incredibly yeah. challenging news cycle, to put it extremely mildly um, and quickly. And I was trying to find time really early in the morning before the world had entered my brain. And so I was writing these poems to a uh, you, and I had started calling the you Naomi, and the dates were what I was using in my like Scrivener, which is my like manuscript software file, um, to sort of organize them by date. And I hadn't really yet like married all of it together until I got maybe. 25 or 30 of them down and was like, these might actually be letters. These might not be like notes that you dated towards something else. There's something happening here that um, is pretty unusual for me, like the longer lines and the more like narrative or plot sort of like having a character, like that's not really, doesn't really typify my work otherwise, but I sort of was just like, why don't we just go with it? Like, why don't we see what happens if I write another 25 or 30? Um, and then as the book writing process goes, I wrote another 25 or 30 and cut most of those first ones and braided them all together. So it is something that I'm not sure I will ever do again in the exact same way. It, it is, uh, you know, you use the word unique. It is absolutely unique in my, um, like to the work I'd done previously and, and probably next. Um, but it was really energizing, especially as things got more difficult just sort of in the world and, and in, in life and in my life to have, to sit down and know kind of what the shape of the thing would be. Um, none of them are really, um, at least when I, when I wrote the thing in word, they never really went over a page and in the book, very rarely do they go over two pages. Um, so you sort of have this like, okay, here's the sort of shape of the thing I'm going to bring out on the page, as opposed to the intimidation that I'm sure, um, a lot of folks in here can identify with of starting with nothing, <laughs> you know, like after a while I thought, okay, we have a conversation to keep going. Like what else do they have to talk about? And that, that was a, a really helpful way to keep the project moving. Yeah. Um, the next thing that I was kind of, uh, wanted to touch on just for our audience, can you talk a little bit more about who Naomi is, um, whether Naomi's a real person or, um, someone like, who are you talking to in the book? Yeah, I have gotten that question a lot. And it started when I had my friends read the manuscript and um, we're like, who is this person? And I, I don't, you know, I, even as someone who works in like confessional poetry, which is to say like poetry that's very closely linked to my personhood and my identities, um, which this book very much is, um, having said all of that, like, I don't know a person named Naomi to whom I wrote all of these letters. She's absolutely a fabrication in the sense that um, these letters were created um, along with her. Um, there are elements of her 
that I drew absolutely from other people that I know, um, people that, um, that just sort of like, as I started talking about this, this collection more with people and sort of giving specific language to some of the like ideas about who she was, I got a little stuck. I'm trying to think of the right way to say this. I had an earlier draft. This is probably the best way to say this, where I was like, I'm going to do half and half, and it's going to be like the letters going back and forth. And I realized that that failed pretty quickly because I didn't want Naomi to be as like tangible and complete as the speaker. The, the poems really um, primarily, I think, work to help the speaker understand a lot about herself in a way that if the two of them were equally kind of present in the collection, um, I'm not sure it would have worked in the same way. Um, and also because I had sort of created her at the beginning of this whole process, um, just as someone to talk to, to sort of as a, at a difficult personal time in my life where I was like sort of starting to untangle things about like my sexual identity and um, certainly my like position as a woman in this country with everything that was going on at that time. And was sort of just like what it, you know, negotiating things around safety, negotiating things around mental illness. And was like, it's really just the best person to talk to would be somebody who doesn't exist. <laughs> <laughs> first, <laughs> like to sort of just put it all down and, and then see what happens. Um, and so in that way, I think she's kind of like a composite of people I know and love in my life who I then did have those conversations with and come to sort of fully realize, um, who she might be had she been real. Um, and then also in as much as I'm capable of like fiction, which is to say very, very little, she, in that sense is like like she doesn't have a social security number. Like, you know, she's not, yeah. she's not based on a real person in that way. It's a great question though. Yeah. I love that. Cool. Yeah. You, I, it's interesting to hear about the half and half and how that didn't work. And, you know, something that I really was thinking about as I was reading today, is just that I, I love the moments where Naomi kind of interjects. It's like in all caps um, where it's Naomi speaking presumably, or imagined to be speaking but I also love that, like, you have to fill in the blanks for yourself as a reader, that it's not all just, like, handed to you. Um, so that's really cool to hear. Um, you also, like, talked about the confessional aspect of this book. Um, and I was wondering, so for our audience, if you haven't read it, there's a lot about Judaism and about sexuality and gender um, and struggling with mental illness. Did writing this book kind of help you um, explore all of these different identities more? And can you talk a little bit maybe about how? Yeah, I, I wrote my first book, um, The Glad Hand of God Points Backwards, really heavily focused on Judaism and um, being, a, being the granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor and feeling really like I don't know if I have anything more to say about being Jewish. I feel like I left it all on the mat with that book. And then um, obviously, surprise, <laughs> um, one of the things that I think really shifted for me in the writing of, of this book was the, the, the way that my position as a Jewish woman shifted in this country with the change in the political climate. Um, and I mentioned that I wrote this book in Pittsburgh. Um, I had moved out of Pittsburgh to here in Chicago just a couple of months before the Tree of Life shooting, which is not mentioned in this book. Um, Cause like I said, it happened really just a few months after I finished the first full draft of the collection um, in the neighborhood that I used to live in. So part of my preoccupation with the Jewish aspects of this book, especially in revision was sort of just like, well, I'm seeing myself in this new context in terms of um, the stories I heard growing up from my grandmother about preparedness and about assimilation and um, that really sounded and felt different. The stakes of it felt different as, as I was writing this book. So the, the elements in this book, I think that are the most like overtly exploratory about Judaism really touched the Holocaust legacy pretty closely. Um, and as for the other, the elements you mentioned about gender and sexuality, absolutely. Um, I felt very, um, I, I'm somebody who, I think always my whole life was like, I'm not sure I'm straight, um, but I don't really know what, how to explore that information. And I um, met my now husband um, in college and I'm 35. And so I'd sort of kind of gone through this process largely in an interior space. Like I, I was sort of like, well, what does it mean if 
and the way that it kind of ends up being explored in the book is an idea of like betweenness that there isn't um and and the book does use the word bisexual which is how if i like you know if i were putting a pin on i think is what it would say um i really appreciate the way the book allowed me to sort of slip into like the way that just like with my relationship to judaism like that the who we are changes over time mm -hmm. um it, these things are not fixed within ourselves and they're not fixed in the way that we're received in the world and as somebody who is a very like anxious person who has OCD and is a poet, I've always felt like I needed to know the exact word like for something and to be really careful about um, like using language to, to perfectly describe who I am. And this book thankfully kind of pushed me out of that mode to be like, well, what if, what if you'll never firmly rest in a specific box? Or what if um, you, you keep changing as you get older? Like how useful is this, this desire you have to think that you can know yourself perfectly and permanently. And so this, this book definitely helped me to let go of some of that, like intense, like must have certainty at all times and, and sort of leave the interrogation and the betweenness and the, the lasting questions in the book and not feel like obligated to resolve them, which then helped in my real life to think, oh, I can also do that <laughs> with my person and not just with my book, like with my human form, I can do that. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, so we've got a couple questions from the audience. The first one is, do the speakers of the poems and Naomi have a specific age depicted throughout the book? If so, what made you choose those ages? And if not, what made you decide that such a detail was not necessary? Oh, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. So the speaker does mention early on, um, and, uh, and this is, again, I mentioned I'm a confessional poet. I'm a largely... Um, unimaginative person <laughs> when it comes to um, like writing outside the self in terms of like developing characters or plot that that I've fiction. I'm not a fiction writer. Um, and early on in the collection, I don't have the poem on my screen, but um, she says um, to Naomi, I write to you at 30. Uh, and it's a poem specifically about the speaker's body. I think she says, I write to you at 30. I carry around this muscular bag referring to her person at 30, her body at 30. Um, and I don't think that Naomi is ever assigned an age in the same way. Um, and in my head, they were sort of, they're sort of like peer generations. I think, I, I think there probably is enough evidence in the book to support the, like the level of sort of like ongoing existential uncertainty and anxiety that as somebody who's in the older third of the millennial cohort, but solidly a millennial, I think would probably fit with the way that Naomi responds to certain things in the book. Um, so I would probably put them close to me, but that's also, again, because this, this really did feel like it was a writing through, um, a lot of sort of things that were very close to like my identity. And, and so, um, it probably wouldn't fit with details in the book that they were wildly different, um, or far apart in age, but I don't really have like a, she's 32. <laughs> um, yeah. but I love that question. You know, it's when you build a world in a book, sometimes you don't realize what you're filling in because you can see the whole picture that other people who don't have what's in going on inside your brain to access. Yeah, thanks James for that question. And then the other one that we have is from Christian and they say an extension of the form question. Could you talk a little bit about how you arrived at the almost prose-like lineation syntactical organization for many of these poems and perhaps how certain poems break away from that pattern? Yeah, I, so the, the, I happened upon this form in some ways because I was really thinking of their early drafts as being not only drafts um, in terms of the content and the approach to content, but also truly in the form. Like sometimes when I write early drafts of more traditionally lyric lineated poems, I do avoid line breaks in the beginning anyway, just because sometimes it's helpful to have a fuller look at the page before you start lineating. It really it depends for me. but. In this case, part of it was the connection to the epistolary form. Um, not that it requires anything specific in terms of line or meter, but it felt more authentic that these, these lines would spool out like sentences, um, that, it, that there would need to be some sort of like corresponding formal acknowledgement that the speaker was writing Naomi lyric poems or sonnets or, um, I think the other piece of it, and this also connects to why they're double spaced is because I went that route, 
I still wanted something visual to mark them as other than like a block of paragraphed prose. So they are line broken almost exclusively, I think consistently by sentence. So they're usually one long sentence. They break with a, almost always with an end stopped period, sometimes a comma or a question mark. Um, but they do deviate, that's, a, that's very true, and a few places. Um, a couple deviate in the unfinished or unsent drafts. And those I like to sort of think of as um, labored over or fragmented by the speaker in a different way. Um, some of them are some of the more difficult poems for the speaker to write, sort of like confessions about sexual desire or um, about mental illness, where I think it, they're just, they're, they're destructed a little bit or manipulated by the speaker. Um, I, I would need to look over what to be able to like say with 100% confidence, but I believe that nearly all the letters that are that are dated look have that same sort of long line. Um, I like the drama of the sentence. I've been reading um, a lot when I was working on this book and still now a lot of writers that work really powerfully in the like lyric essay form. Um, writers like um, Maggie Nelson and Sarah Manguso, who sometimes will just put a sentence or two on a page. And to me, the power of that um, is enormous. And, and I think that some of these play with that in ways that um, force you to pause and, and breathe in ways that a block of prose wouldn't, um, but that still approximates what you might see in a letter from another person a little bit more than if you were sending somebody like um, quatrains or, or couplets that were really tight to the left margin or something like that. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for that. Um, we're just about out of time here. I feel like given um, just how much your book kind of references all of these other wonderful people, I'd love to hear what's on your writing desk, what you're reading currently. Um, and then if you could finish this out with one more poem, uh, that'll be the end of our evening, but it's, we could talk forever and ever, but it's just been wonderful to, yeah. um, to hear a little bit more about the Naomi letters. So yeah. I'll, I'll bow out now and you can, answer the question and then end us out with a poem. Perfect. Um, yes, yeah, so I am very slowly re-entering my reading practice. Um, I don't know if other folks in the room have had this experience, but I really struggled to read during the pandemic. I felt my attention span was pretty much shredded and I did a lot more like passive uh, consumption of media, like TV, social media, staring at the wall. Um, but I've been reading again and the book that I'm reading right now is Knox by Ann Carson, which is a tome. It is uh, in cardboard and you open it almost like a box for a kid's toy and out comes this accordion of collage and um, lyric. And um, it's a it's an elegy to her, her deceased brother. Um, and I, I really like it for right now for coming out of COVID because it is so saturated in frank grief. And um, it's the sort of frankness about grief and death that I have felt um, that I need. I need somebody to acknowledge um, like what we have seen and been through over the past year. Um, I haven't yet been able to get back into some books that I was reading before COVID. Um, and this book was certainly written well before the pandemic, but is, is sort of really in conversation, I think, with a lot of what, um, you know, just about how do you mourn somebody that you love. Um, so yes, I will read one more poem. I'm very, very... Um, this has just been so wonderful. It's been so wonderful to talk with you tonight, Genevieve, and to see so many of you all here tonight. Um, and I wanted to end on one of the poems in the collection. I know we talked about some like more serious themes in the book, um, but there's a lot of poems in here where the speaker's just like, I love you and I miss you so much and I wish you were here. And um, this is a poem about my favorite, I think now closed in Pittsburgh, um, Delhi, uh, called Smallman Delhi and Murray. And um, I was in there and was like thinking about how ridiculously provocative the like smoked cow's tongues look. And then I was like, this also needs to go into a poem. Um, and so this is the poem that came to mind after working on, um, that sort of quick vision and it's November 18th, 2016. The delicatessen on Murray keeps a placard in its window for the Hossets. It tracks the date of every Sabbath sundown, creeping earlier by the week. Our God lives closest to us in the dark when body and spirit seek distinction. Why do I always forget that the weather's different where you sleep 
Naomi. I imagine you also cold, warming your body with your hands. Beside me, the other Jewish women, the visibly devout, cue for their Shabbat ingredients. Here, the pink cow's tongue uncurls irresistibly, already smoked. Here, the animal haunches are stacked, salted, and glistening. I want you even here, pressed to deli glass on a November afternoon. What if it's my desire that lengthens the night? How the letters I write you cool once they leave my hands. How the world holds itself so still in the frost, waiting. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Genevieve. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Uh, I want to uh, thank Genevieve uh, for jumping in. Uh, you can buy the Naomi letters at Ampersand Books. The link is in the chat. Uh, you can see this and other uh, readings of ours uh, online uh, within uh, the next few weeks. Uh, and I want to tell, uh, want to say uh, the next um, Tuesdays with Boas will be in two weeks. Um, uh, on May 11th with the writer E.C. Osandu. So I uh, hope to see you then and uh, thank you and have a good night.